Okay, hopefully the microphone is on now. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give these talks. So I'll be talking about ontological rings of, well, mainly of MGN bar, moduli space of stable curves, but also sometimes MG, maybe other things. A few words on that in a minute. So the basic object of study here is the N bar, Lean Mumford moduli space of stable n pointed curves. of genus G, arithmetic genus G. And there are some words I'm leaving out here that technically one should have like connected curves and I'm always going to be working over the complex numbers to make our lives easier. And the goal of these talks is more or less goal to understand intersection theory of this very fundamental moduli space. And I mean, that's a pretty large goal, and unfortunately we still don't have that great understanding, so I'm just going to say goal understand the intersection theory of MGN bar better. All right, so today I'm mainly going to be defining tautological ring and basically talking about what a tautological class looks like on MGN bar. But before I get started on that, just a couple of notes on the history of the tautological ring. The very, very abbreviated history begins in the 1980s Mumford defined tautological ring R star of MG. Tautological ring will always be R star. So this is MG, moduli space of smooth curves of genus G. It's a context in which Mumford first defined in context in which it was studied for quite a while. And then around 2000, maybe the early 2000, um, the study of this tautological, systematic study of this ring for MGN bars sort of began then. The you know, definition was sort of floating around at the time is my understanding, but Faber and Pantarapanda wrote down definition of R star of MGN bar. This is the sort of historical progression. Started with MG, then at some point decided to study MGN bar. And most, more of the recent developments have been about MGN bar. So that's a history, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is that in this series of lectures, I'll be going about things in a slightly ahistorical point of view. I'm going to start with R star of MG and bar. That's how I'm going to define tautological ring. Tautological ring for R star of MG will then just be the restriction of R star of MG bar. So I'm start with basic properties here. Then go back and discuss what's known about this classical setting, R star of MG. And then return to MGN bar. And for, for a lot of applications, MGN bar is a lot more relevant. For a lot of other moduli problems, girl wooden theory, we want to think about moduli space of stable curves. But 
MG is a simpler space in a lot of ways, and so there's somewhat more known about it, and we'll discuss the theory of this probably tomorrow. So that's, that's going to be the progression here, just a note about that. Okay, so I should start with a few words about what MGN bar looks like for those who might not be as familiar. So MGN bar, the moduli space points, what do points in it parameterize? Points in it look like you have a curve and then you have endpoints x1 through xn in the curve. And here c should be, um, again, there are words like connected that, I should, that I'm going to omit. Also, all my curves will be complete. But the important things in terms of singularities, the only singularities are simple nodes. And marked points, n marked points labeled one through n on the curve should be smooth points of C, so away from the nodes. And what's more, they should be pairwise distinct. And then there's a stability condition. So the conceptual way of thinking about the stability condition is that you want your curve to have only finitely many automorphisms. So the way the marked points come into that is that you need to have your marked points and your nodes sort of pin down the curve enough so only as finitely many automorphisms. It turns out that there is a more explicit combinatorial condition that this turns into. So just write it here. Stability condition is that any irreducible component of your curve of C of genus zero must have at least three distinguished points. Distinguished points meaning either nodes or marked points here, depending on automorphisms. And there's something you need to worry about a bit here about how do I count self nodes? I count those as two distinguished points of each side of the node. So these are the conditions on stable curve. Maybe I should also write here somewhere that, again, n here is number of marked points, g is the arithmetic genus. of C. What did you say? So I, I would need that if I um, worried about the case of M10 bar. Then I would have to worry about that. But the, the point is that maybe I should write the condition here. I'm always going to take Two g minus two plus n greater than zero. My curves are also always connected, and this means you don't have a problem with with elliptic automorphisms like that. Sometimes it's stayed like that, but from this sort of combinatorial point of view that I'm going to use in these lectures, I really just have this one condition, and I want to avoid the case of genus one with no points. So. Condition I have at the top here, aside from this one case of M1 bar, this is just ruling out the case of like M02 bar, M01 bar. Those, those, in those cases, these stability conditions can't be met. So you don't have enough marked points. But you shouldn't have to worry about that. Always, G and N will be larger. There won't be any issues with that. We'll just have stability condition that rational components must have at least three points pinning down the automorphisms. Okay, so I don't want to say too much about the 
about this moduli space, I'm going to assume that, that we've constructed it or someone's constructed it. Um, basic properties of it. Get into that in a second, but what, what do these look like? I mean, this is the technical conditions that we have. From the topological point of view, okay, we have some components. They are like Riemann surfaces of some genus. So this is a genus two component. Maybe we glue onto that a sphere. Let's say that the sphere touches itself in one point. So it would be a topological picture of a curve. Let's maybe say we have some marked points. We have point two there and point one here. So this would be a picture of a element of M32 bar. We're thinking about these as simple nodes. It's arithmetic genus three because this is genus two, that's genus one, but then the self node basically adds a genus. So that's the topological picture, but we'll mainly be interested in thinking about this from more, um, more algebraic point of view of two irreducible components, what does a curve look like? It looks like a curve. Say this is genus two, then this meets another, the other irreducible component at one point. Then this component has a self node. Then I have the point two there and the point one somewhere on this curve. Two, two, two different ways of, of talking about the same type of curve. I mean, obviously when I write down this picture, I'm not telling you what the complex structure is of this genus two Riemann surface, but these two pictures are two, two ways of talking about the same stable curve. Is what points in the moduli space look like. Of course, most of the points in the moduli space don't have any nodes at all. Have MGN, is open dense subset of MGN bar, and a point in MGN just looks like you have a curve of genus G and you have endpoints on it. Okay, so that's what stable curves look like, They're going to be the main topic of these lectures. And just some basic facts, which I'm not going to worry about too much, but will be relevant. What is MGN bar? Well, technically it's a Deline Mumford stack. If you want, you can think about this instead as being like a complex orbifold. You really want to lie a little bit, you can just think about this as a manifold, but it's going to be complete and smooth. Right, smooth, compact, and dimension 3G minus 3 plus n. Complex dimension. I'm always going to use complex dimensions because thinking about this algebraically. All right, so MGN bar, it's this nice space, it's this high dimensional orbifold and the goal is to understand the intersection theory of it. Okay, so what do we mean by intersection theory? We mean, well, usually we mean the Chow ring a star MGN bar. Studying intersection theory would mean knowing the structure of this Chow ring. So this is algebraic cycles, modulo rational equivalents. If you aren't that familiar with Chow rings, for the purposes of what I'm going to be talking about this week, it's actually pretty safe to work with cohomology instead. If I take cohomology, whatever type of cohomology you want, say singular cohomology of 
that with rational coefficients. In general, the child brain cohomology are quite far apart. They're quite far apart in this situation, too. In general, you just have a map from one to the other, cycle map. Neither injective nor surjective in general. So why, why am I telling you that it's sort of equivalent to study these things for the, for the purposes of these talks? Um, so well, I, I still haven't told you what tautological ring is, and in a little bit I'll actually define it. But what it will end up being is a subring. Logical ring R star MGN bar is a subring of the Chow ring. And the philosophy here, dating back to Mumford is that you should think about this as the subring consisting of the classes that actually show up naturally in what we're doing. I mean, the full child ring or full cohomology even are gigantic objects with lots of, lots of classes in there that, that we don't know much about. But in practice, practice, we think of this as R star MGN bar equals classes rising naturally in geometry. And this is not completely true. There, I mean, it's a subring. There, there are constructions of non-tautological classes, but and so some of the constructions are even things that you could see as being fairly natural. But most, this is mostly true. You describe some, some subvariety of modular space of curves, it's, it's almost certainly it. the, the um, class of that subvariety is almost certainly in this subring. That's the idea here. And then, you can also define tautological cohomology. Give the cycle map a name, I don't know, V. This is just the map to an algebraic cycle. You associate to it the corresponding cohomology class. And our H star MGN bar, this is tautological cohomology, is the image of our star usual tautological ring under the cycle map and it's an open question probably a hard question whether or not the cycle map is actually induces an isomorphism between tautological cohomology and tautological ring. This is why I say that for purposes of this talk you can think about cohomology or think about Chow ring because as far as we know the subring, the corresponding subrings are, are the same. I mean, they might not be the same, but. I mean, so there are some things that we prove, which are, technically there are some things that, are tr that we can prove are true in, in just in cohomology, some things that we can prove are true in both Chow and cohomology, so there's some difference in what we can prove. But in, in practice, it seems to be the case that even in situations where we start out with some cohomological construction, we've, we've pretty much always been able to eventually find some algebraic way of, of lifting that. Just Write that down as, I mean, as just open question whether be from 
R star MGN bar to R H star MGN bar is an isomorphism. And when actually proving things, sometimes you have to think about where am I actually proving things, but from the purpose of like intuition about these spaces, you can think about cohomology if you want, you can think about the Chow ring if you want. Um, the open question, I, mean, I, I don't know if we have great evidence for it. It's making a very strong claim to say this is true in all, for all G and N, but it's certainly true a lot of the time. Okay, so I should start moving towards actually defining the subring and not just saying that it's a class that's arising naturally in geometry. So to do that, I have to go back and talk about the structure of MGN bar more. So you have these curves, which the sort of generic curve in MGN bar is just some smooth curve genus G with n points marked on it, one through n, distinct points. The general thing, general element has some complicated graph theoretic structure where you're gluing together these curves in various ways. You might have self nodes and so on. So one way of formalizing sort of a formal structure for thinking about the serve thing, it's going to be useful to talk about some things which are sometimes called tautological maps. I'm just going to call them talk about maps between the MGN bar. So, first you have the forgetful maps. So, our MG N plus one bar, map that to MGN bar by forgetting about one of the marked points. So, I mean, this sounds simple enough. You just erase the point from here. Um, you have to worry a little bit about what if the curve is no longer stable since you have the stability condition. So, forget one point, then restabilize the curve if necessary. You can think about why the restabilization is well defined. Basically, the idea is that, remember, stability condition is that you can't have a genus zero component with less than three marked points or, or nodes, as distinguished points. So if you forget about one point, you might drop from three to two. What you do in that case, let's, let's say you had two nodes and then you had a marked point. If you forget about that marked point, like point I, forget about point I, then you need to contract the unstable component. So in this case, think about this as being tangent here that that's not really true to, to the geometry though it's more true to the picture. We shouldn't said think of this as just the simple node between them now. One component here, another component here. Let's say G1, G2, G1, G2. Contracted the unstable component. That, that defines forgetful maps, which are nice morphisms between these. Um, in fact, you want to really think about these as moduli spaces of curves. Over each point of MGN bar, you have a curve, the curve C. Piece this together to a universal curve over MGN bar. It's going to be isomorphic to MGN plus one bar. This is the, um, this is the map giving the universal curve. That's another way of thinking about the forgetful maps if you want. Then the other type of maps I want are gluing maps.
No, if, so if you have if you have a genus zero component, I mean, are you talking about the situation where you have like a genus zero component in two points here? Yeah, then, then, then you contract and you move the marked point onto the, yeah. And these are the only two configurations that can happen because you have connected curves. Okay. So gluing maps, which we also have, are a little bit easier to define because you don't have to worry about this, this restabilization. There are two types of gluing maps, though. Call them two and three, though. They're in some sense the same map. MG1 plus one bar cross M, sorry, I want some marked points, N1 plus one cross MG2 plus one N2 plus one bar. So this product of moduli spaces, so we have two stable curves, one of genus G1 plus one, then one plus one markings, other one, G, genus G2. Sorry, why am I doing plus one here? That wasn't, that's not necessary. MG1, N1 plus one bar across MG2, N2 plus one bar will map to MG1 plus G2. N1 plus N2. So what's happening here is that you're choosing one marked point here, one marked point here, and you're gluing the curves together. Nothing deep there. There you have two different curves, I and J, and if you're gluing together I and J, then you get you no longer have any marked points I and J, they've turned into a node. That's why the total number of marked points has decreased by two. But final case, so this was gluing together two points and two different curves. Second one is M G N plus two bar maps to M G plus one comma N bar. So what's happening here is that we have two points on the same curve and glue them together. So generically, this is a self-node. Of course, points I and J might have been on different irreducible components to start with, and then you wouldn't have a self-node. So there's no subtleties of three stabilization here, as you can easily see, because remember, distinguished points, you didn't have at least three distinguished points, distinguished points count nodes, and here the marked points are just turning into nodes. So there are these three sort of families of maps where two and three are really the same. If we were doing moduli spaces of disconnected curves, and two and three would actually be the same. Two is just three where the curve happened to be disconnected. But I'm always going to have moduli space of connected curves. Okay, so these are sort of the fundamental maps between MG and bar. Of course, there are other maps that you can define more complicated ways, like choosing a way of taking a double cover or something like that. But these are the, the most fundamental maps to define, and it turns out that they're all that we need now to define the tautological rings. Yes? So by sections of forgetful map, Yeah, so those sections will correspond to um, the sections will correspond to you replace a marked point with a component like this, a rational bubble with two points on it. So that's the same thing as taking a gluing map where you glue on M03 bar. M03 bar, I didn't mention this before, but by dimension formula, it's dimension zero. It's, in fact, a point. So the map that's talked about is precisely a case where you take MGN bar, MGN plus one bar across M03 bar, take this top map here. Okay, so let's define tautological rank. I don't need this anymore.
The idea is just going to be a tautological ring, and the full cohomology or full chow rings are really large. So we want to take a subring. What we want our subrings to still have these maps between them, rather still respect these maps. I mean, these maps induced by a pu pu push forward or pullback maps between chow rings or between cohomology. And we want the tautological rings to still have that structure given by these maps. Actual definition is that the tautological rings R star MGN bar are simultaneously defined for all GN satisfying 2G minus 2 plus N greater than zero, the same condition I wrote down before, which is what's needed for these moduli spaces to be non-empty. So how are they defined? Defined as the smallest subrings, here I mean subrings with a, with a unit element. My rings all, all have a zero and a one. I want them to be subrings with one of the child rings. Smallest subrings closed under push forward by forgetful and gluing maps. Okay, so this definition, it's, the idea of it is that, okay, you have these subrings, you start out just knowing that you have the element one everywhere, element one, the chow ring, just being the class of the entire moduli space as a cycle. So you start with just those, but then they're subrings, so you're allowed to multiply things together. Okay, multiplying things together, if you just have one, doesn't help you. But you can take one, you can push forward it along some of these maps, you can use it in a few different ways, you can multiply things together, you can push forward more, and so on. You take the ring consisting of all the things that you can obtain, starting with fundamental classes in these moduli spaces and pushing forward using these maps. Okay. So let's go through some examples of what is in the tautological ring. So, well, the first thing that we can do is we take, so if we want to push forward a map under one of these things, one of these morphisms, push of our, taking the push forward of one under a forgetful map just gives you zero by, by dimension reasons. It, it, can't give you anything. But pushing forward under a gluing map, maybe I should clarify that by being closed under push forward in the case of map of type two here, I mean you take a tautological class here, tautological class here, and you push forward their um, product over here. And what you get here should be tautological by the definition. Start with, well, let's take the Let's actually let iota be the map that we discussed recently, mg1 bar cross m03 bar to mg2 bar. So let that be the gluing map. Really when saying what do I mean by the gluing map, I, I mean I need to choose a point there and one of these points here and glue them together and I need to choose labels for the remaining two points between one and two. So there are some choices here, but it doesn't really matter here. The A gluing map. 
then find delta one two to be yeah they're 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 two maps but for they're different but the push forward will be the same here of one. Yeah, there are lots and lots of maps. Yes, the U in general. In this specific case, it doesn't matter. Yes, in, in general, really here, you have to pick G, you have to pick N, and then you have to pick ways of indexing the um, various points involved here, pairing up the ones you're gluing together, choosing which one you forget, and so on. Right, but I mean, you might also worry about how, how you order the remaining points. I mean, you can take the induced order, that, that's fine. If you want, you can use that point, in that, that, those maps instead. If you want, you can use those maps instead. It, I mean, all, all, all of these maps are basically the same thing. If I wanted to, to write down technically what I mean here, I should, when I talk about forgetful map, I should say there are forgetful maps pi one through pi n plus one, each forgetting a point, and then I, I don't need to read, and then using the induced order on the remaining points here. And then in the case of gluing maps here, Yes, you need to use all of them. I'm saying in the specific example, I'm using one of these two maps here from MG1 bar cross M03 bar, or the, the same map because M03 bar is a point. It's the same map though. So again, what, what is this um, morphism? This is, I said this out loud, maybe I should actually write this down. This map from MG1, bar across M03 bar to MG2 bar. We start with a stable curve. It has one marked point on it somewhere, named one. This is my element of MG1 bar. I also need to take a point in M03 bar. There's only one point there. It looks like a projective line with three points on it. I then glue together this, in this map, iota sends this pair to something which should now have two points. What is it doing? I'm gluing that point to one of these. And the reason why I'm saying it doesn't matter is that the curve that you end up with, it doesn't matter which one you glue it to, it doesn't matter how the remaining ones are ordered, is that the stable curve you end up with is just the original stable curve, but at one you bubbled off a rational curve here and put the two points at the end. So, yes, in, in general, you have very different maps based on how you permute it. You have an SN action on tautological ring given by permuting the points. SN representation structure is complicated in general, but this is, a, this is a simple example. And I want to start by taking the push forward of one under this gluing map. So what is this? This pushing forward one via this inclusion is going to be just the class of the image here. So this is the class of the closure of the locus of curves with points one and two on their own component here. Closure just meaning you can degenerate this. So this is a divisor. This is just an example of one class that from the definition has to be in the tautological ring. It's a class of this divisor. Could take other gluing maps, get other divisors. These are the, the boundary divisors of the moduli space. I mean, stick with this delta one, two for a second. So 
these things are subrings, so I can certainly square this element, and it will also be a tautological ring. But I want to, so far I've constructed one interesting element, mg2 bar. Let's now take the, let pi, let's say pi2 be the forgetful map from mg2 bar to mg1 bar, forget point two. Then what I can do is I can take the delta one two class I defined before, I can square it, I can multiply by minus one, and now I can push forward by pi two. Again, tall logical rings are small strings closed under push forward by these maps. So anything I can obtain by multiplication and pushing forward repeatedly should be in tautological ring. Check dimensions, this will be in R1 of mg1 bar. So what is this? Well, we've taken some class of this divisor here. We've, we've intersected it with itself. And, if we, and then we've done this push forward. And if we wanted, we could compute what we got here. We'd have to do some natural geometry, compute the normal bundle to this divisor, and compute what the first trend class is of that normal bundle. Maybe I'll just say what the answer is this class is more commonly referred to as pi one. Again, a class of a divisor in MG1 bar. So this can be computed, again, by thinking of this as a self-intersection, interpreting it as a normal bundle, and then doing this push forward to, the push forward basically gets rid of this tail here of points one and two. Can be computed to be the first churn class of a line bundle L, where L is the line bundle given by the cotangent space to the curve C at the point X1, one marked point we have. This is the first example of a class that we could have defined directly. Psi one is usually defined directly as the first trend class of this natural line model you can define. Line model, you can also think of it as the relative dualizing sheaf of mg one bar over mg. Think of that as a universal curve. So it's a very natural object here and this computation, which I've just claimed here, is why psi is in the tautological ring as defined there. We can keep on going. We now have psi that we can work with. We're still allowed in constructing tautological classes. We can still multiply things together, push forward. So we let pi mg1 bar to mg bar be the forgetful map, only one in this case. Then kappa i is defined as the push forward of psi 1 raised to the i plus first power. So psi 1 was this class on mg1 bar could have mentioned one, raise it to the i plus first power, then push forward for forgetting about the last point, end up with a class in ri of mg bar. So 
So you might worry that you can sort of keep going here and get more and more complicated classes as, as you go using this definition. Start with just a class one, we have all these maps you can work with. So that we push forward by a gluing map to get this boundary divisor, then we push forward, multiply things together and push forward repeatedly to get this psi class and these kappa classes. So you can do this for any non-negative integer i. It turns out there's sort of a limit to how complicated things can get. So to make that precise, which I should have enough time to do before I finish for today. The main ingredients for an arbitrary tautological class will be sort of the idea of these three examples, you have these gluing maps give you boundary strata, you have these psi classes, you have these kappa classes. So first I should say that I just defined psi one here in mg one bar and I find the kappas on mg bar. But you can also can similarly define Psi one through psi n in R one of M G N bar. In terms of the line bundle, that will be the first trend class of the line bundle given by the cotangent space to the ith marked point in general. Pick one of the marked points, and you also have classes kappa zero, kappa one. in R star of MGN bar. And really, kappa i is always an Ri of MGN bar. These are again given by having one more marked point, having the psi class on that additional marked point, raising that psi class to a power, and then forgetting about it. So if you wanted to Construct those, you just follow the same procedure that we did here, except start with more points at the beginning. Have mg n plus one bar to start with. And map to mg n plus two bar here. And take the self-intersection, push forward back to mg n plus one bar by forgetting about a one of the two marked points at the end. Do the same thing here. You can basically carry the other points with you through this computation. And you get n different psi classes because again of this issue about how you how you order your endpoints. All right. So to actually, my goal is going to be to tell you a set of additive generators for the tautological ring. So to do this, I need to use, talk a bit more about gluing maps. We're only using one very specific gluing map here. So basically I want to think about compositions of gluing maps. And the easiest way to do this is the idea of a dual graph. Definition. If C x1 through xn is a stable curve, then a dual graph is given by, okay, so, so maybe I'll say give a name to its dual, dual graph gamma is given by following corresponds vertices of gamma correspond to irreducible components of the curve C. Edges of gamma correspond to 
nodes of C. Each node has two irreducible components on each side, so it corresponds to an edge. If the self node, then it will correspond to a self edge, a loop in the graph. And finally, legs, or if you prefer, think about them as half edges of gamma, correspond to the end marked points. The half edge only is attached to one vertex. It's attached to the vertex corresponding to the irreducible component where the point xi lives. So that's what the graph itself looks like. It has a bit of extra structure that you want to remember, which is that the vertices are labeled by the genus of the corresponding irreducible component, the geometric genus. And the legs are corresponded by the label on the corresponding marked point. So also vertices labeled with the genus legs labeled by index of marking. So an example in the situation I had before where we had a genus two component and a genus zero component, we had two marked points, two, one. So this is C. In this case, gamma will have two vertices because we have two irreducible components. They're labeled by genus two, genus zero. And there are two nodes here, one of them between the two components and one of them a self node. And finally, the legs, we have a leg here marked with a two and a leg here marked with a one for the two marked points. So that's the dual graph of the curve that I drew there. This is yet another way of drawing a stable curve. Instead of drawing the dual graph and this sort of picture convey exactly the same information. So then the idea is that dual graphs gamma are in bijection with something I'll call generalized gluing maps iota sub gamma which before the gluing maps, which I've now erased, but they were between a product of spaces gluing together some of the marked points, gluing together two of the marked points. Here, you're going to t allow gluing together more than one pair of points at a time. It's going to be from some product, M, G, I, N, I bar, some M, G, N bar. And the point is that the graph precisely tells you the information of which points to glue together and also what the sizes of these components are. So in this case, the corresponding map iota gamma will be from, we have an M22 bar, so we have two, this vertex has valence two counting the legs, cross M04 bar. And we're gluing together two pairs of points here the graph tells you exactly which pairs of points and how to label the remaining points. The result is an element of M32 bar. So these pictures I've been drawing also give sort of the schematic for gluing together a bunch of curves. Generalized gluing maps. These gluing maps, you can also think these are just compositions of the basic gluing maps I drew before. So in particular, topological rings should be closed and they're pushed forward by these. Maybe I should also note that if you push forward one under this gluing map, then you get the, a, a boundary stratum consisting of take all the curves of the given topological type, take that locus, take its closure, take the class of that, up to a scalar, which is the automorphisms of the graph, the push forward of one will be equal to the class of that boundary stratum. So 
Okay. So now the theorem of Draper and Pantaraponta is that R star of MGN bar is additively generated by classes of the form. So we pick some stable graph. Stable graphs for a given genus and number of marked points. I didn't emphasize this earlier, but from the dual graph, you can recover the starting G and N. N is just the number of legs. G is given by adding together the genus vertices and then adding the cycle number of the graph. So I want to pick a gamma for the specific G and N. Take this corresponding generalized gluing map and push forward a monomial in Psi and Kappa classes. These Psi and Kappa classes. So I've explained why classes of this form are in tautological ring. It turns out that this is as complicated as it gets in some sense. These, any tautological class can be written as a sum of these. So I'm, I'm almost out of time for today. I, I should just emphasize though, that this is just, these are generators. They're not a basis. They're not even close to a basis. I mean, see there shouldn't be a basis. I haven't even imposed any degree restrictions on the monomial and the Psi and Kappa classes. Take Psi to the hundredth power. Unless G is pretty large or N is pretty large, that's going to be zero. So definitely not, not a basis. So tautological classes can be written in this form. There's still the question if you want, one way of thinking about the structure of this ring is what are the relations between these additive generators? Okay, tomorrow I'll say a little bit more about this and then back up as I said at the beginning today, I would to case of R star of MG. Maybe I can just write down here at the moment that we've defined tautological ring of MG and bar R star of mg is just the restriction of R star of mg bar. I can define tautological rings for any subspace and any subvariety of mg n bar that I want just by restriction. Okay. Yes. No, it does need to satisfy the stability conditions because of what these components end up being. I didn't go into this in detail, but if you have a graph and you want to read out what the different components will be and what the different factors will be, you have to look at each vertex and take its genus, which is labeled on it, and also the number of um, half edges incident to it. And the stability condition is precisely that you can't have any um, M02 bar, M01 bar factors at the end. So you actually need the same stability condition, the generalized cluing maps. What did you say? Yeah, so, so the definition just uses push forward. Um, Something I'll, I'll say a bit about tomorrow is that Graeber and Ponderaponda established, after establishing this, that the tautological ring is closed under pullbacks as well as push forwards.
So, yeah, so, so one question that you might ask is, is the tautological ring generated as a ring by, say, the psi's, the kappa's, and the boundary divisors? And the answer is no. You need at least a bit more. And I think that you sort of need arbitrarily complicated gamma, is my belief. So what does really know? Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we know for sure the thing that I said that you need more than that. Whether or not there's some better expression, yeah, we don't know. Yes, so I will get to both of those things later in this week. The geometric description of which classes? I mean, RH star MG is some subring. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I said, psi is given by the Chern class of some line bundle. The, the kappas don't have a good description as Chern classes of a bundle themselves, but they're push forwards of powers of the psi classes, which again are. But yeah, in general, if you have a class defined as churn classes of some naturally defined vector bundle um, over MGN bar, then it's, it's probably tautological because these definitions are close to using vector bundles. Yes? Sorry. Sorry, I don't understand the question. Do these rings have extra structure or? Sorry, I still don't, I can't really hear you very well. 